first of all, thank you for being here and being awake at the end of a long day too. Um, I'm sure everyone, if you're like me, your brain is just like exploding with new information and new ideas and hopefully there's going to be feedback on this. Um, so my name is Will Field. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, what I'm working on and um, the sorts of the, the, the kinds of projects that, that, that I'm uh, making at the City University of New York um, and focus on how we've uh, migrated our stack from uh, mostly proprietary software to open source solutions. Uh, this is uh, this migration uh, process is very much um, a work in progress, and we're still kind of poking around at different tools that we can use. And my hope is that either in the Q and A or at some point, someone comes up to me and says, "That's not a good way of doing it. You should do it this way." Or have you considered that? So, looking forward to that. Um, and already, just being at this conference, I've, I've discovered new, new things to explore. So I work at the City University of New York, known as CUNY, in the Center for Urban Research. And we work on maps that uh, look at different civic issues um, around the city, uh, also at the state level, New York state level, and some of our projects at the national level. Um, I work with uh, Steve Romalewski and uh, Valley, Valerie Bauer. Um, so for example, uh, you're looking at one of our projects for the Department of Homeless Services of New York. Um, this is, uh, you can find what resources are available for the homeless population um, and where uh, sort of demographic uh, distributions of um, different, you know, different areas that you might be interested in. This is a map that we made for the New York Academy of Medicine, and it's looking at the um, the aging population of New York. Uh, so you can compare. You can also look at different demographics. See, these areas have, you know, this age with this income or this education level. And then you can also look at what uh, services are available, what hospitals, what um, you know, parks, open spaces, um, internet access. Um, and this is called Who Represents Me? And it's a New York, another New York City based application where you can put in your address and you can see who your representative is uh, at the city council district all the way up to all the way up to president so your you know congressional representative um, state legislature everything so this is our the 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 project when I when I was onboarded, um, this was sort of the, we were midway through this project. Um, what you're looking at is a map of the self response rate to the 2020 census. So I'm going to explain what that is. So there have been a few very awesome talks about um, redistricting. So the data that's used for redistricting in the United States is comes from the uh, decennial census. So every 10 years, uh, it's mandated by the Constitution. There is supposed to be a complete count of everybody who is residing within the United States. Um, so we worked on a map during the self-response phase. So there, there's sort of different phases to the census. Um, the first is people respond on their own before the next phase, which is uh, census workers go door to door, send out mailings, call people, try to make sure everyone's counted. The self-response phase is uh, critical because it, it's where the most um, accurate data comes from. Um, so 
various uh, civil rights groups and um, complete count groups funded us to make this map where every day during that phase of the census we could map um, who had been counted and what, what areas needed outreach. So at the end of, um, or after the census, that data is then used for redistricting. Um, so again, you may have seen another talk about uh, redistricting, but um, I'll just very briefly, every state in the, in the US does, has a different process. It's often very messy, very politically charged, um, but most states have some kind of mechanism for taking public input and um, public, publicly drawn maps um, and using that input to adopt a final proposal as the final boundaries. And by final, I should put that in scare quotes because uh, there's constantly, um, until the next census happens, there's often uh, legal challenges. Um, it, it, it's, it's messy. <laughs> um, so we wanted to make a tool that allowed people to um, not draw boundaries themselves because there are a lot of great tools out there that already let you draw your own map but to compare current districts with um, maps that have been uh, formally submitted to different redistricting commissions in, in different states. Um, so I'm talking about these two uh, projects in particular because the first, the census project, was the last project where we were using our old architecture and the redistricting projects were really our first major project using our newer, our newer stack. So first I'll go through briefly the, the old stack and, and talk about why we've uh, moved away from it. So um, as you can see, it, it, it primarily relied on um, Microsoft SQL, ArcGIS, and the .NET framework. So these were perfectly viable products. They, you know, we were able to get our app made and used, um, but very kind of inflexible. And I'll, I'll go into each sort of component. So we hosted all of our data, all the map, all the, all the um, yeah, so all, all our data on Microsoft SQL. Um, Microsoft SQL has a spatial extension, but you can't serve vector tiles from it directly. So what we had to do was uh, serve well-known text and then convert, and then use, also use an UTF grid, um, which uh, I should mention, I, I, I don't come from a, a GIS background, I come from a first an animation background and then a software development background. So when I saw this in particular, I thought that's very clever, the, the whole UTF grid kind of approach, but it seems very outdated because this was already 20, 2020. So um, we, our, our, new, our new stack uses vector tiles instead and those tiles are served from PostGIS instead of Microsoft SQL. So we also hosted data on our own ArcGIS server, um, which was pretty difficult to maintain and upgrade. Uh, for instance, there was, at, at some point, we had to do an upgrade to have the server work with SSL, and it was like almost impossible to, to do, to, to just take our, our server instance and, and upgrade it. it. was just a, yeah. .NET, so we used .NET to um, build our API and also um, manage our front end. So .NET, again, very, 
you know, robust solution as long as you're staying within that framework and you don't venture too far from it. Because, um, yeah, so once you do, you have to deal with all sorts of compatibility issues. You have different versions of .NET, different versions of Windows and IIS and Visual Studio, and then the, the package manager, NuGet, you have to make sure all the dependencies stay up to date. Uh, and it's, it's um, a lot of overhead. So this is our new stack, again, still, still changing. Um, but we've unified the, the pre-processing of the data to QGIS, and um, we're also using Python, specifically GeoPandas, um, to do the pre-processing. Uh, and as you can see, we're using Postgres and PostGIS instead of Microsoft SQL. And we're still hosting some data on Mapbox, uh, but already I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I've been, there, there are other options, Map Tyler. Um, we're still poking around, still trying to figure out what the best solutions are. And instead of using .NET, our front end and our back end are using Node. Um, our front end is using Vue, um, Vue CLI, and the back end is using a, a REST API that's, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. So this is the, um, some screenshots from the completed app using the new stack. This is looking at New York State. So at the top, there's a, a slider where you can compare the former districts with proposals. And you can zoom in, you can click on a specific district. Uh, there's some, some other overlays you can add and you can really, um, oh, so, so you can look at different levels of, repre of, uh, of representation. So there's uh, congressional districts, and then there's state assembly and state senate districts. Um, and what we really kind of pride ourselves on with this app is that you're not just looking at the map itself, but you can really dig down into the demographic data that's, that underlies these new maps. So uh, it's not just looking at voting patterns. It's not just saying there, there are different redistricting metrics to say is this metric, is this district compact or is it, um, yeah, there, there, there are different scores, but, but our app um, lets you look into um, sort of all, all of these things using census data looking at um, voting age population, the average uh, district population for all of the districts in the state versus this particular one that you've picked. Um, so uh, moving along, uh, we begin our projects by creating a Mapbox style. And this kind of acts as a a skeleton or an outline for, for the final map. Uh, and it's then pretty heavily manipulated in the code to, to do what we want it to do. We keep the actual district layers separate in Postgres uh, for reasons that I'll, I'll kind of get into later. So some things that we had to learn moving to, to, to Mapbox away from ArcGIS. Uh, some some downsides. We um, it's a little hard to insert a layer exactly in the stack where you want it to. So we came up with placeholder layers, which are just empty text layers, and then you can easily say like call the the placeholder layer um, district proposal or coropleth, and then it's pretty easy to find where you want to put it in. Um, there's also no support for layer groups. So I, I've kind of came up with a hack where I kind of added a tag to the layer ID and then regex found where, what the tag was. Um, so 
some things that are yeah, still kind of being worked out. Uh, and we found that uploading changes is a little bulky. So the district proposals change pretty frequently um, and new districts are being added and litigated. So that's sort of why we kept those, that, that actual district data separate in our Postgres database. Um, so, sorry. So, putting, let's see. So, I'm going to talk about our, our Postgres database itself. Uh, so, we get data from both fair district advocates who are drawing their own maps and formally submitting them to the um, redistricting commission. And then sometimes the maps would come from um, the redistricting commission itself from the state. And those came in all sorts of different formats. So ideally, they would either give us a shape file or um, there are, it's called census blocks, which are the, the smallest geographic unit for, the, for census data. And so they would give us a block list of um, which blocks were included in which district. Sometimes, though, they would give us, a, um, you know, like a PDF or something that we really had to wrangle. So this part, frankly, is kind of magic to me. This is um, a lot of work that my colleague Valerie did, taking the um, the data that the the census data, which we have by uh, I believe by block and taking the shape files and combining them to say, okay, this district has, includes these blocks, and so we can calculate what the different demographic um, metrics are based on that. So um, she uses uh, GeoPandas and uh, QGIS and Postgres to um, do those calculations and ultimately, we end up with our Postgres database, which has the shape files and the demographic data. And so we create a new database for each proposal um, and, and serve tiles and, and do all the spatial analysis with, with Post, PostGIS. So uh, one of the challenges with adapting to Postgres there are so many ways to serve vector tiles from, uh, from PostGIS. So we do use, um, I think someone asked in the last uh, talk, so I'll explain it. So there, so there is ST, I think it's ST MVT uh, query that, that selects the, the shape. Um, but then how do you expose that through an API? There are lots of options. Uh, so picking one was, took, a, took a lot of research and poking around and seeing what worked and didn't work. Um, creating backups and managing the development to production instances is something that we're still working on. Um, so database replication is kind of the ideal way of doing it. Right now we're running some scripts that, that um, dump the old database and restore it in production when we're ready. Uh, so, moving on to the, uh, the actual API. Um, so, looking through all these options is very overwhelming. What, what I actually ended up doing was I found a fantastic node API called Dirt Simple PostGIS HTTP API. Um, so, our API is forked from that. And what I really like about this is that it is Dirt Simple and that you can look at the code and you understand what's going on. You can make new API uh, routes and tie them to uh, Postgres queries very, very easily. Um, so that's sort of why we went with that. It's built with um, Fastify and Swagger, which expose this nice um, documentation page where you can test the API and test queries. 
So fortunately, we don't deal with any confidential or private information. Um, I'm certainly not a security expert. Uh, so, you know, this, this could potentially be a, a downside to using a, the, uh, this particular API. Um, but we did take some, some basic precautions to make sure there was no, like, SQL injection or anything like that. Um, the API also didn't come with any means of caching tiles. Um, so we did find that when traffic went up, that there was a, a, a fair amount of hit to our performance. So I sort of rolled my own cache um, using uh, node cache and recache and, and sort of worked that into the existing API. And that's something, you know, that the, I can't stress enough how awesome it is that it's simple to understand and open source, and I could just dive into the code and create my own cache like that, and, and it, it works. Uh, so keeping it up to date, like I mentioned, it's, it was really difficult to keep .NET up to date. Node is easier, but it's still, we have to, you know, make sure packages are, are updated when new, there are new releases. Um, so we run NPM updates to, to update packages. And then deployment, so we, we're um, hosting our API and our uh, front end uh, through IIS, so we have uh, a somewhat complicated way of, of using of, of running the Node API as a Windows service. Um, this is something that I really want to change. I really want to um, use Docker and uh, simplify the, the deployment. Um, so, like I said, the um, both workflows, the proprietary and the open source workflows, did produce ultimately end products that were usable and did what we want. Um, but with the open source solutions, for one thing, they're much more um, up to date, <laughs> more modern. They perform better. Um, and it's just so much nicer to maintain these, these systems. Um, and I sleep a little bit better at night knowing that if something crashes, I'll be able to look at the code and see what's going on and make a fix rather than like hoping that it's not some update that ArcGIS or Microsoft has kind of forced on us. Um, so thank you. <laughs> um, that was helpful. And let me know if you have any questions.